So the recording is started. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second uh, professional development talk of the semester. This week, we're going to be hearing from two different speakers. Uh, first, we have Joe Renaud, who is going to tell us a little bit about uh, opportunities to do research at NASA as an undergraduate and a graduate student. And then after that, we'll be hearing from uh, Dr. Vora, who is a professor here at GMU, and he's going to talk about research opportunities at GMU for students. So without further ado, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to Joe. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, thanks for inviting me to come speak to everyone today. Um, so yeah, I wasn't quite sure the format of these, so I do have just some kind of general background advice before I get into more specific opportunities. Um, but you know, feel free to skip ahead. Let me see if I can steal Patrick's thunder a little bit before uh, he gets a chance to speak. But yeah, uh, I'm a postdoc at NASA Goddard, which is just outside of DC. And my research mostly focuses on tidal dynamics of moons within our solar system and also exoplanets outside of our solar system. So how gravity and orbits cause planets to flex and uh, cause their interiors to churn and generate heat. Um, the famous example that most people know of is uh, Jupiter's moon Io, which has such extreme tidal heating that uh, it drives volcanism across its entire surface. Um, I also graduated from George Mason not too long ago. I got my PhD in 2019, and then I, I was actually at GMU for my undergrad, uh, which I received in 2013. So I think I was at GMU for 10 years in total by the end of it, somewhere around there. So I know the, <laughs> the area and the school quite well. But uh, just, a, just a little bit more about me is, you know, just I am a big fan of Renaissance fairs. As Patrick said before we started recording, I'm a huge nerd. Um, I've also gotten back into long distance running over the pandemic, so that's been a fun way to slowly kill myself. My favorite television show is Stargate SG-1, my favorite sci-fi show that is. And when I was an undergrad, I, uh, besides doing physics, I also did theater and also started the TEDx program at GNU, which I believe is still going on <laughs> in various forms. But like I said, I graduated from George Mason and am now at Goddard. And in terms of my personal research path, it's been a little crazy, but I feel like that's how most uh, most people's uh, lives go. Um, my first research, my first like what I would consider real research project um, was during undergrad. I believe it was like my sophomore or junior year, and it was actually on uh, uh, aneurysms, <laughs> like cerebral uh, aneurysms. So not fun stuff <laughs> like medical research, applying mathematical modeling to see how aneurysms grow and change over time. So I got involved in that project and I went to my first conference and I remember I had a poster and I was presenting some of the work I was doing and a gentleman came up to me and was listening very intently to my talk and everything. And then he just uh, kind of leaned in and whispered to me and said, I think I have one. Can you help me? And then that's as soon as that happened, I was like, no, I'm getting out of medical research. <laughs> I don't want to do any of that. <laughs> so as soon as I uh, got back, I was like, I'm gonna, I didn't want to pick a different area to to look into. So and I've always been a huge fan of space and, and planetary science. So I knew I wanted to kind of go in more of that direction. And I started getting involved with the George Mason University Observatory and doing some research there, making along with a few other graduate students who made some of the first uh, detections of exoplanets at GMU uh, using the telescope there. And I like this figure. This is a, a light curve transit. So this is the light uh, we're receiving from a star that an exoplanet is supposed to be passing in front of. And you always see light curves in talks that are really nice, like these really clean dips that show the shadow of the planet passing in front of the star. But I like to show what research looks like when it's not in its ideal state. So this was one night where I think it was like two in the morning and we were getting pretty good data for an exoplanet. And then all of a sudden clouds came in and kind of ruined most of the uh, observations. That's what, what's happening over there. Um, so this was kind of my observatory phase of research. Uh, but when I actually needed to pick a project for my PhD thesis, 
I ended up getting in contact with a scientist at NASA Goddard, where I am now, uh, Dr. Wade Henning, and he took me on as a student to look at uh, more geophysics problems when it comes to planets. So how the interiors of the planets and how their composition, what they're made out of, affects how their orbits change via these tidal dynamics that I was mentioning earlier. So I started working, I started doing a lot of work just on geophysics, trying to do a crash course in geology and composition of materials and even some quantum mechanics, which isn't real. But, uh, and I applied that to the moons in the outer solar system. So these are the Galilean moons of Jupiter, which are pretty famous tidal objects. So Io, Europa, and Ganymede. And that was pretty much what I did for my uh, PhD work was focus on the moons in our solar system and uh, how different tides uh, affect them. And then once I graduated, I started my postdoc position that I'm in now, where I applied that same physics to look at exoplanets. So planets outside of our universe or outside of our solar system um, and how their orbits in thermal state can change with these tides. And then actually more recently, just within the past few months, I have started to come back to the solar system and apply this to our moon. So it's taken me this long to get back to the most famous <laughs> source of tides that everyone knows about is our own moon. So that was kind of my research path. So you, you can see that whatever you end up going down, it's probably not going to be linear and you should definitely be open to changing up um, your topic. And I actually think that I stuck a little bit too close to the same topic. I've basically been doing tides for the past five years or so. So I think I even need to branch out more. Um, but you know, just a, just a piece of advice to always look for new opportunities in different areas. Um, so in terms of undergraduate research, it sounds like uh, this is mostly going to be uh, what Patrick's gonna be talking about. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I'll just say that the two opportunities that I took advantage of at Mason was the ASIP program and then also the Oscar URSP program for both undergraduate uh, research. Um, and I, I did some quick Googling and as far as I know, these are both still in existence, um, especially the URS, URSP because that uh, provides funding while you do research. But my quick uh, bits of advice for finding opportunities is just to cold email or meet face to face with faculty that are doing interesting work and just share your interests and what you would like to do. Be sure to look up different labs in the area, like how I got involved at Goddard. And I, the word of warning I would give is that internships are great. It's a great way to get experience, but uh, just be careful with them because you, you really shouldn't be doing work for free. Like this is, doing research is a hard work and it's very, very time consuming. And that should be, <laughs> you should be uh, paid for that. So uh, just be very wary of any opportunities that offer you you know, exposure <laughs> for, for nothing. Um, more outside of Mason is uh, for undergraduate research, the NSF REU program, which Patrick might talk more about, and then specifically to NASA is the internship program. And the one thing I wanna point out here is this website has changed recently. So this has high school internships, undergraduate re internships that are paid. Uh, it also has graduate fellowships on here and uh, I even I even think some other like uh, non student programs. So this is kind of like a one stop shop for a bunch of different opportunities that you can apply to. Um, my big advice before starting uh, a project, and this is this is kind of in the undergraduate uh, section of the talk, but it really applies to graduate work and even postdoc work is to reach out to current and former students or postdocs or grad students that have worked with a, the specific lab or advisor that you are looking at, because they will be able to give you a much better perspective on what the work is actually like. And make sure to ask about personalities and workplace culture, workloads, work safety. I've heard some pretty terrible stories, not out of GMU, unfortunately, but I've heard some pretty terrible stories about other universities where you know the PI of a lab basically just would leave for months on end and just let the grad students and undergrad students just run run havoc without really knowing what they're doing. Um, and there's some pretty unsafe uh, things happening at that particular institution. So those are things that you definitely want to make sure you understand beforehand. Um, also talk about the mentoring style of the advisor. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. 
And if, if the students have a chance to get on any papers or go to any conferences or workshops. And then the, the probably the most important thing is to figure out your personality, like what kind of work that you want to do and how it how it's going to fit in with this potential research project. So my personal research, I am mostly computer programming and you know maybe doing some paper derivation. So I pretty much spend my entire time in front of a computer, which works pretty well for me, but that definitely does not uh, work well for other people. So if you want to be in a lab doing you know, stuff with your hands, building equipment, building instruments, uh, make sure that whatever project you're going into works with with your personality. Also, when it comes to space research, a lot of times we're observing, um, you know, at telescopes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, those can be extremely late nights, which may not work with your particular work life balance, or it might require a lot of travel, like if the observatory is in a different country. So just make sure you understand um, some of those constraints before you go into it. But the most important thing uh, I think for any project is to recognize that research projects are two way streets like it's not just you doing the work like you should expect your advisor to give back in some way. So be sure to sit down with your advisor and talk about different goals that you have for this project and also be very clear on stuff like meeting intervals like you're going to meet every thursday or you know whatever that frequency is like once a month or once every other week just to be sure that you all are on the same page and that you don't just you know have one meeting and then go off and you know read a bunch of papers and then don't talk to your advisor again for three months and then come back and they're like ah oh, why didn't you do all this stuff but uh in terms of the actual goals there's obviously research goals like getting papers published or or working on proposals, going to conferences, but there's also career development goals that your advisor should be helping you with. So what do you want to do after this project and what can your advisor do to help you achieve that? So be sure to have those types of conversations with a, a, a potential mentor. That's not the right slide. Sorry, one second. That's the last slide. I'm not going to go through all these slides. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, so during your actual research project, um, the big thing that I think a lot of students, especially undergrads who might be doing their first research project ever, is just being intimidated by the amount of information out there. So just don't worry about not knowing things. We all started there. Like I still don't know very much about my field and I've been in it for so long. Um, and reading up on background information is hard because there's literally hundreds of papers published every year and you also have to go back into past years and look at what work has been done before so my advice there is just to skim paper papers look up videos like youtube videos just to get an introduction is honestly a really easy way to to start picking up where to look for other information same thing with wikipedia like just to quickly familiarize yourself with a new topic that you're not familiar with um, and then you can dive into the papers and get more in depth uh, I highly recommend getting organized early on in your project. So coming up with a paper management system, like how you organize all the research papers that you're reading. Like I personally use a program called Mendeley to do this, uh, but there's other ones out there. Same things with note taking and to do systems. That's I, I personally am pretty lazy and unorganized. So I really rely on these systems to make sure that I stay on track for things. So these are just a couple examples of the ones that I use, but again, there's lots of examples. I'd also recommend tracking your time, some using some method, <laughs> at least during like the work day, uh, just because it really helps you understand how much of a commitment a certain project is. And if you need to have a conversation with your advisor, if uh, your research is starting to become a bigger burden and in interfering with your coursework or just your personal life. Um, be sure that you ask your advisor to introduce you to other scientists in the field. Um, ask if you can speak at any local seminars. Uh, I can tell you that I run a couple of seminars at Goddard and we're always looking for uh, student speakers. So it doesn't matter if you don't have a lot of really cool results, you know, just reach out and then see what, have a conversation from there. You never know what, particular seminar is looking for. And the 
probably the most important thing and also the hardest thing and something I had to do during my PhD work is if you are in the middle of a project, even if you're like a year or two years into it, and it's just not working out, like you're not clicking with your advisor, the project itself is not really working, um, you just don't like the research, um, the, the best thing you can do is just walk away from it. Um, I, I had a research project at the beginning of my PhD work, and the work was interesting. Um, I didn't mind the, the science, but I just wasn't clicking with my advisor at the time. So I ended up switching advisors, and that was the best decision I made uh, during grad school. Uh, but it's hard to make because you've already committed so much time and it did delay my uh, graduation date. So it might end up uh, affecting when you finish your your work. But I still, you know, still think it was a good decision and um, encourage <laughs> encourage you to to keep checking in with yourself and seeing if um, it's time to step away from something. And just a, a big picture looking looking ahead at a career in research. Um, this is where I, I kind of get a little bit depressing <laughs> at first, these, these red lines here, but, the, but research is a pretty bumpy road. Um, it can be very awarding um, if, it, if it works with your personality and if you have some good experiences, but just some examples of hurdles that a lot of folks run into is that the pay is generally lower for your education level. Like if you get a, a master's or a doctorate or something, a lot of times it's more profitable <laughs> to go work at a uh, company or something like that. But, you know, we're not all in it for the money or, at least, you know, some of us aren't. So it, you might be okay sacrificing that to, to work on cool new projects. Um, DEIA issues are rampant everywhere. They're a problem at Goddard. They're a problem at universities. It, it's, it's getting better in some ways. It's getting worse in other ways, <laughs> but that's something that um, we're all dealing with. The whole grant to paper pipeline is a pretty um, depressing system <laughs> is, is the nicest way I can say it. And then the uh, actual job opportunities after you finish your, your grad degree or postdoc in research, like in academia, uh, are pretty few and far between, so it can be quite difficult. But like I said, there's there's pros and cons, and uh, the nice thing is that usually hours are a lot more flexible, and you get to work with some incredible people. I've met a lot of really really good friends um, doing the work I'm doing, both when I was a grad student and then also at Goddard now, and you get to work on incredible stuff. Like this is a, a the recent picture. Um, you might have seen of the selfie that James Webb took. And then this is a picture I took of it um, back in 2017 when it was at Goddard. This was uh, it at a vibration test. So it's inside of this box here. So it's, I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't involved with the engineering of this or anything, but it's really cool to be at the same place where these really awesome projects are happening. Um, so you just have to weigh those and, and what and figure out what fits your personality. But just some general advice um, to prepare yourself for a career in research is to make a personal and professional website and make sure your resume is updated and available on it. Uh, if there's any kind of coding required for your work or any work you might want to do, um, it's good to start a GitHub page and contribute to open source projects. And those don't have to be related to research. They could be open source projects for you know any kind of <laughs> any kind of program. But it just it shows it's it's a good thing to show that you have experience in programming and that you um, um, you can use things like GitHub and Python or whatever else. Uh, make an org ID. This takes like literally three minutes, but I know so many people, and especially colleagues of mine, that don't have one. Uh, but org ID is just an easy way to to find people in research and see like where did they go to school and what positions they've had. Uh, and it's usually attached to whatever papers you've published or even presentations you've given. So that takes two seconds to make a unique or ORC ID. Uh, so definitely make that. Uh, and then get involved in something outside of research. So whether it be outreach or science communication, public engagement. I did some science policy stuff a little bit in grad school, working with uh, AAAS, doing congressional visits where you go to Congress and talk about how cool James Webb is and stuff like that so they continue to fund it. Um, so anything like that, it's just good to have something other than research on your resume to show that you are have a little bit broader scope <laughs> to yourself. Um, and this is probably the, the 
the slide that uh, I was actually supposed to talk about. <laughs> uh, this is talking about what to do in between undergrad and grad school. Um, so getting into grad school is hard and it's not getting easier. And um, what's becoming more and more popular is taking a break in between undergrad and grad school, uh, taking time off or working a different job in between there just to see exactly what you wanna do. And if you can get a job doing research, um, that's even better because then you get to get a taste of it without doing a full six year commitment. Um, I, I will, I put the little asterisk there to say that I did not take any time off. I actually didn't even take a summer off. I went straight from undergrad into grad school um, a week later. Um, and I don't know, I don't necessarily regret that, but I, I do think that it would have been nice to, to take some time off um, because you don't know where your life is gonna be on the other side of grad school because it's such a big commitment. Um, so, you know, make, giving yourself time in between is, is nice and it boosts your resume, which helps your chances of being accepted into the program or project that you want to. Um, if you can get internships or short term positions, that's great. Uh, a new thing that uh, I really wanted to promote is a relatively new concept called a post bachelor baccalaureate <laughs> program um, or post back program. Uh, this is where there's for for a long time there's been things called postdoc programs where after you finish your phd you go into a temporary position to get more experience and i'll talk about that a little bit later um but a new uh program is the post back where it's the same thing except it's after you're done of your undergrad work um and specifically for nasa goddard uh it started doing a post back program in uh like 2017 18 ish a few years ago so it's still very new and there hasn't been that many folks that have gone through it, but it's been uh, very successful from what I've heard. You know, there's been a few bumps, um, but overall pretty successful program. Um, but the whole idea of it, at least for Goddard, and it'll vary if you do one through a different university or something like that, is that you're actually employed by a local university on what's called a cooperative agreement. So you're actually an employee of say University of Maryland or George Mason University but you do all of your work at Goddard. So your desk isn't at GMU, your desk is at Goddard, if we had desks <laughs> anymore. Um, and you're working with people at Goddard. Um, so, but you, your pay comes out of University of Maryland, your, your health insurance, all of that comes out of the university. But you get to work on really cool projects like, like James Webb or Tess or anything like that, anything you're interested in. Um, and it really gets your name out there because you'll be doing actual research, publishing papers, going to conferences, talking to scientists in your field that helps your resume, which again will help you get into the grad program that you want. Um, Goddard's still pretty inexperienced with this, so there are some, some things to look out for. I think the biggest thing is that advisors at Goddard tend to not really know what you're given between your university that you're employed by and Goddard itself. So they, they, they'll they think like, oh, they're getting their computer from the university, so I don't have to provide that. But that's not true. They have to provide it. So I think that the biggest thing is just ask for everything. Don't be afraid to ask for anything. So ask for a tour of the campus. Ask them to introduce you to different people at Goddard, the, the lab chiefs and division directors. Um, ask for a computer, a desk, getting on mailing lists, um, and different points of contact. So I'd be happy to, to talk about that more um, if folks are interested. I think the, the biggest hurdle, which is why there's no links on here, is the advertisement for these programs. They're, they're not, it's not like a program that you apply to. It's more when a scientist has some grant money to hire a postbac that they will put out an advertisement. So you kind of just have to wait till those ads come out. But if you're interested, I can um, put some feelers out to see if there's any current positions open right now. Um, advice for grad school. I'm not I'm not sure uh, the audience exactly for this, um, but uh, we actually put together um, some of the early career scientists at Goddard put together this big document on uh, advice for getting into grad school and then also how to um, you know, make the most out of your grad program. So that's what this image here is, um, this, a picture of that document. So I think the, the best thing for me to say is uh, 
if you're interested in that, I would be happy to share it with anyone. So just email me for a copy. But a lot of the advice I have on here is the same thing I, I said for getting involved with a project is, you know, talk to current and former students. Um, you know, working in a STEM field is, is really difficult. So be sure to make friends with other graduate students so that you can work on problems together and, you know, commiserate when you're studying for your quals and stuff like that. Um, don't be afraid to switch advisors if a project's not working out. Again, that's what I was saying before about stepping away. And uh, if you do have a teaching, if you're a teaching assistant, um, time management is really critical because teaching, especially grading, takes up a huge proportion of your time. And after you're done with grad school, you are moving into that postdoc phase that I mentioned. So a postdoc position, at least when it comes to STEM fields, this is kind of the residency of science. So I, like medical students, after they finish their school, they have a residency at a hospital for a few years. And that's the same idea here. It's just a, a permanent position. It's a full-time job, but you are a temporary employee. So you're expected to not stay um, in that position for more than about two or three years. Um, but you're doing research, getting more experience, publishing papers, working on proposals and stuff like that. Um, and some people do two or more postdocs, but you know, usually uh, if you're going into the academia route, you probably need to do at least one postdoc position. A lot of people don't come out of grad school and just go straight into like a faculty position. Um, there's two kind of major buckets of postdoc positions. There's the fellowships and then the granted um, postdoc positions. So fellowships are something where you apply to, you know, they're, they're highly competitive. And uh, if you're selected, then you're given money to work on a project at some institution. So I'm on a uh, NASA postdoctoral fellowship to do work at NASA Goddard. Um, but an, a granted position is where there's a faculty member or a researcher at a national lab um, that has grant money and they can hire a postdoc um, to help them on whatever the, that grant is for. Um, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, usually fellowships are deemed as uh, more prestigious um, and they, they do look better on a CV and they generally give you more freedom to work on whatever you actually wanna work on. But that, that's kind of a double-edged sword because you can get too much freedom where you lose focus and you don't, you know, you, you get stuff done, but it may not be like a lot of papers in a short, short amount of time or something like that. Whereas if you're on a grant, you, you know, you have to finish that grant. So you need to make sure that you're doing work to a very specific goal. Whereas a fellowship is a little bit more wishy-washy. So I, I, my, my advice is always apply to fellowships. You know, the worst case scenario is you turn it down, but uh, also look out for um, advertised you know, grant type positions and don't ever feel you know, diminished because you are uh, on a grant position versus a fellowship. You're, you're doing science, you're doing cool work. Um, and a, what it actually is like to be a postdoc is uh, you actually are not really doing a ton of research, especially after your first year or so. Uh, you're usually writing papers and applying to grants. I, I took a little uh, screenshot here of my personal past month of time tracking. Um, and this was a weird month. I, I was on a different assignment for this month. But uh, these orange boxes here are actual research. So you can see that my actual research time, at least for this past month, is very little compared to the amount of other stuff that I'm, I'm working on right now. So just have that in mind. It's different than uh, grad school. And the postdoc is the time to be thinking about your future career. Like, do you want to stay in academia? Do you want to work at a government lab? Or do you want to go to industry? And when somebody says industry, they're talking about um, companies or corporations or something like that. So I know a lot of people who have done postdocs and gone on to work at uh, places like Lockheed or, or just switched entirely into stuff like economics or something else like that. And I think that is it. So that just kind of wanted to give a high level view of, of advice um, from going from undergrad to to postdoc um, for research. Um, but my contact information is up here. And again, I'm more than happy to talk to anyone one on one or uh, answer any questions over email if you are interested. And thanks. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thank you so much, Joe. That was a a very informative talk. Um, I think in the interest of time, we should probably move on and have Dr. Vora uh, do his talk as well. And then if we have more time at the end, then we can 
uh, see if anyone has any questions. Cool, thanks, Michael. And just so you know, unfortunately, I have a hard stop at four. Um, I take over with my little one, so I got to I got to bounce them, but I'll try to get through as much as I can. So I think I uh, first of all want to thank Joe for giving such a complete and honest uh, description of what it's like to be a graduate student, undergraduate student, and postdoc, and the transitions between them. Um, Joe was uh, one of the first students I met when I came to George Mason seven some years ago now, uh, and he was one of the most impressive. And it's it's um, you know definitely go to him if you have any questions about you know the whole process because he'll know it. So thanks, Joe. Good job. And SG one is quite good, but if you haven't seen the Expanse yet, then you need to check yourself. Um, it's on my list. It's 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 absurdly good. Um, they do such a good job with the zero G fight scenes and space battles. Um, all right. Anyway, anyway, though, let us. Um, so I'll be doing a little bit of a different tack here in the sense of I'm. this is more of a propaganda talk about um, specifically uh, research positions that you might find at Mason in the area of quantum science and engineering. Um, I will not be focusing on how to get them. Joe has already covered that, so I'll, I'll leave that leave that alone. But I'm always happy to talk with students about whatever. So um, you can feel free to reach out to me afterwards. And so most of what I'm going to be sharing with you is actually for our center's, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, annual report. Um, so I won't get into the nitty gritty numbers stuff, but I'll more focus on, you know, the perspective about why quantum is important and what sort of things it can enable for you. And then in addition to that, I'll then um, follow up with, um, you know, what our center does, what it uh, and and how you can get involved with that. So uh, do I have permission to share screen? Uh, you Let's should try it. OK, great. So uh, I'm the director of the Quantum Science Engineering Center here at George Mason University. Um, and uh, in, our, in our center, um, we have a number of different departments from both engineering and science, and as well as from the uh, education uh, college as well. And so our, our overall goal is to um, increase the presence of uh, uh, research and education going in the quantum sciences uh, going on at George Mason University and bring that to the students as well. Um, so first, before we go into too much else, I'm going to just move these, get rid of all your faces. They're very distracting. Fancy new logo. Yeah. Yeah. Somebody stole our name at Maryland. So we had to make a new logo. Did you, Joe may have helped with the new logo actually. Um, so um, first of all, uh, the first thing to discuss here is, is what is quantum? Um, and so quantum, I was giving this talk to um, some of our administrators here at GMU. And so this is very, very high level. But the main point of um, mainly what you need to know for what I'm going to talk about is just that reality is very different at small scales than it is at large human sized scales. And this should really come as no surprise. There's no reason a priori why an atom should follow exactly the same rules as an agglomeration of matter with self-awareness, i.e. a human listening to this, um, comprised of trillion, zillion, billion, jillion, billion atoms, right? There's no reason those rules should be the same, and of course they're not. When you go down to the atomic length scales or nanometer, sub-nanometer length scales, you find that reality is instead a good bit more fuzzy. And instead of having, um, you know, in kind of a classic experiment about this, thought experiment is putting a particle in a box, uh, and what would you think about in a classical language? Well, you think you have a marble in a box, but if you make the box small enough, instead what you end up getting is a particle that kind of smooths out and instead has wave-like solutions for its position inside of this box. And it's a little bit more like, you know, kind of the allowable vibrational frequencies when you pluck a guitar string. So things are very strange at small length scales. We have to describe um, the position of particles uh, with probabilistic functions, all their states have probabilistic functions determining their values. Uh, particles display wave-like characteristics in addition to particle-like characteristics. And it's uh, fundamentally impossible to know some certain phenomena with perfect certainty, such as the uh, uh, position and momentum of a particle at a single time. Okay, 
Yeah. So when we talk about taking quantum and using it for technologies, there are two main principles you want to uh, uh, that we try to take advantage of them of for this. The first is the principle of superposition, where we can have an op an object that can occupy two uh, potentially allowed states at the same time. So this is akin to your cat being dead and alive, right? This is Schrodinger's cat. And the other um, situation is, uh, the other uh, property we want to take advantage of is quantum entanglement. And this is where you have multiple objects interacting with each other in such a way that they have now have probability distributions that are inherently intertwined. And so when you measure the properties of one of these objects, you automatically know the properties of the other one. Generally, what we mean when we talk about quantum computing and quantum technologies are systems that take advantage of these two things um, superposition and entanglement, and make them a fundamental uh, uh, a fundamental operating mechanism of the device in question. Okay, and uh, the reason why this is so exciting is that entanglement and superposition have no classical equivalents at all, and they provide access to a lot of new and very interesting capabilities. And so, I want to talk about a couple of those very quickly here for you. Um, okay, so the first of these is quantum computing. Um, so some of you may have heard about quantum computing, um, you know, and the, and the idea with quantum computing is that the fundamental computing element, the bit in this case is a quantum object. And it's a quantum object that can be put into superposition states and it can be entangled with other quantum objects such that you have a global probability distribution where everybody's state is linked to everybody else's. Now, um, you can then take these entangled states and manipulate them. And if you do that, then you have access to a new kind of computing and you can use new algorithms to process information in ways that are very different from the way we do it classically. Um, and so some you know, end applications of this are, are highly military or security related in the sense of code breaking. Right? Public key encryption ceases to be a viable method of securing data if anybody ever makes a quantum computer with a thousand qubits in it. Uh, if they'll be able to fracture those numbers quicker than you can snap your fingers. Right? It just fundamentally changes the game. But there are many applications of quantum computing in a lot of other niche areas um, in medical technologies, right, in the design of drugs, right, and in simulation of, um, of, of quantum systems themselves. Now, another, another application area is in quantum communication. While quantum computing can hack any encryption algorithm we have right now, quantum communication uses quantum mechanical effects to actually um, create unbreakable keys that can be distributed and used to protect yourselves against the, the quantum computers. And this is actually something that's um, already you know, being deployed. This is a, a example from a Chinese uh, experiment where they actually sent up a satellite uh, and they included it and they used it to distribute entangled photons across the planet. Uh, and this is the basis for building up a network where you can do quantum key distribution, where you can distribute perfectly secure um, encrypted keys that can allow you to communicate without eavesdropping. All right, so that's very fun. What else? Quantum sensing. So this, I think many of the call, people on this call, I think almost all of them are biased heavily towards the astronomical uh, uh, preference, and that's fine. We all make bad choices in life. Um, but, uh, you know, this is uh, something that's actually really quite interesting. Uh, in that the discovery of gravitational waves, i.e. LIGO, was only enabled by the use of non-classical light. Um, so to beat the noise limit, to detect the differences in the length of these arms, to get these interference patterns, uh, they actually had to use something called squeezed light, which is instead of just a normal laser beam on there, where you prepare your photons in your laser beam into a very unique and specific coherent quantum state, and you send those along. And when you're using this kind of what we would call non-classical light to do an interferometric experiment, it allows you to really beat the typical noise limits that would occur, that would exist in a system like this. Other things we can do is we can make uh, quantum accelerometers and clocks for positions, navigation, and timing. Uh, and we can also use quantum states for biosensing um, by uh, making target molecules that bind to cells of interest or um, using entangled photons themselves to image, uh, uh, image systems without killing them.
And there are many other applications coming. You know, if Goldman Sachs isn't rich enough, hell, let's make them richer. Uh, uh, quantum computers are going to excel at any large parallelizable problem. Uh, finance is a big area where that is that is happening. JP Morgan actually poached one of the top quantum scientists from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, made him a vice president of the company. Um, in aerospace, modeling fluid dynamics is notoriously difficult. Being able to do that is possible with a quantum computer, and so it could be very useful for aircraft design as well and drug design and discovery. Um, there's some very nice recent articles demonstrating that you can obtain a factor of a thousand increase in the design time uh, or in the simulation time for understanding protein folding uh, to, to interact with a, for the protein molecule, for a drug molecule to be interacting with uh, a target cells uh, receptor sites. So all of these things motivate um, us putting energy and time into quantum because you have both fundamental physics questions that can be answered uh, and uh, radical advancements in our ability to compute, communicate, and sense the world around us. And so in 2018, a good chunk of money was dumped into this um, by the U.S. government. Uh, and uh, since then, um, the Economic Development Consortium has been formed where 116 partner companies have join together to start to identify how they can really advance quantum in the U.S. Uh, Mason was one of the first six universities to actually join that. So we've had a pretty big hand in helping form this area. Okay. So here at QSEC, what we have tried to do is advance a transdisciplinary approach to quantum research and education. And what does that mean? That means that we want to forget about disciplinary boundaries between fields and just provide people with the opportunities to do very cool stuff. And Joe says, everything smaller than ants is boring. It's very sad. Um, it's a sad view of life. Um, but we want to look, leave disciplinary boundaries behind, and we want to try to find ways in which to catalyze a community of people at Mason who are either interested in taking part in quantum research and education or using quantum for their own research. So one of the uh, applications, we had an interested student whose name I've now forgotten, who wanted to use quantum computers to, sim to do black hole simulations and was hoping to try to find a way to make an algorithm to make them be able to do that. Uh, others have asked about, you know, mixed quantum classical algorithms for approaching those kinds of problems. So we want to just basically find ways to um, cultivate a community of people interested in this and help those who don't necessarily care about it take advantage of it anyway and use it to accelerate their own research. So the areas in which we've developed expertise at George Mason include computing and algorithms, uh, in the development of materials that exhibit quantum mechanical phenomena, at elevated temperatures and in quantum enhanced sensing modalities. Where's the clicker Ruski? Here it is. Um, so some of the, the yeah, this, this is where it becomes much more annual reporty and less general interest in education sort of thing. So I think I'll just jump ahead here. Grown a lot, it's been a long time. God, it's been four years now, good Christ. Um, it's a long time. Um, so who's involved in all this? All right, I, I uh, run the center with a tremendous amount of assistant from my associate directors, assistant director uh, Fang Yu, uh, the director of mathematics department, Maria Melianenko, uh, professor of mechanical engineering, Pilgu Kang, and our director of education, Jessica Rosenberg. Uh, within our group, we have three subgroups in materials, which is run by Igor Mazin and Nirmal Kamir. Sensing, which is run by Pilgu and Dr. Rob Cressman. Uh, computing, which is run by Maria and Fei Li from the Computer Science Department. And Education, which is run by Jessica and Jill Nelson um, over in ECE. And so, you know, some of the, um, this isn't important, but within these different groups, we have all sorts of fun research going on, right? We have a seminar series for quantum materials. You're certainly welcome to join. Um, we've had many external collaborations on interesting work. The scene here, and and lots of lots of uh, uh, interesting studies going on. So within our groups, so in terms of the next thing here is is 
thinking about, you know, how should you get involved with it? And if you're interested about learning more with this, uh, I'm always happy to chat a little bit more about, you know, what options there are. I can share some things with you about the work going on in my lab and what options we have uh, available presently for additional research. So let me pull up the, um, but the main thing to take away with the, the QSEC slides is that um, we have a lot of different research opportunities available with a lot of people doing a lot of very different things from each other. And often, if it isn't a specific one, we may not have one that exactly matches what you're interested in, that, but that can be the catalyst for creating a new research area by bringing, let's say, astrophysicists together with people in the computer science department to improve simulations or find new ways to analyze large data sets, et cetera, et cetera. So um, there's a lot of opportunities here for cross-disciplinary collaboration. We provide um, partial funding for students. So we provide two full GRAs a year um, to work in this space. We require that the student have um, two mentors from different disciplines, but we'll take care of the cost for the year. We provide travel support, publication support, and we also have a seed program where we will fund half of a student's GRA and the rest of it needs to come from their um, co-mentors. Co so there's a lot of opportunities for interesting stuff. And, um, you know, Joe is resting on his planetary laurels right now, and he doesn't need to think about, you know, what new things there might be and how to do them. Um, but that's OK. We, we love him anyway. Uh, but it's a good time right now, especially when the people in the computing field are trying to find use, use cases. Um, well, excuse me. To um, to uh, 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 seek out new opportunities. Okay, so let's see. To close things out, because I have to go very soon, unfortunately. Um, My group does a lot of work in the area of two-dimensional materials. And you, this is called throwing shade, helping humanity is overrated. Yes. I, is that clapping back? Is that what that is? No? Okay. All right. So um, in terms of my group, a lot of what my group is interested in are layered materials and the interfaces between them. So um, a cartoon example of this is shown in the bottom right here, where what we've done is we've layered a three atom thick uh, material called molybdenum diselenide uh, with a uh, superconductor uh, niobium diselenide here. Uh, and what we've been doing a lot is looking at um, optical signatures of interactions between these two materials. And niobium diselenide is a superconductor, uh, and molybdenum diselenide is something called an excitonic material, where every time you provide an electron with a little bit of energy, it finds a, uh, a, a, a positive charge left nearby, and it forms kind of a semiconductor equivalent to a positron. Um, or positronium, excuse me. So it's an atomic-like state and you get very distinct optical signatures from it. And so we've been uh, using optical spectroscopy to study how interactions between these two very different materials give rise to new physics. Um, some of the projects we have to do that, um, you know, involve making these sort of layered structures, which are called van der Waals heterostructures by um, finding ways to isolate atomically thin crystals. And you can actually do this by hand with a little bit of tape, which is kind of funny that that got the Nobel Prize in 09. Um, and we're building um, within our lab kind of a little robot um, to make all of these things with our help uh, within an argon atmosphere to prevent there being oxidative effects. This work, this project also involves travel to Brookhaven National Lab to work on a even better uh, multi-million dollar funded robotic system where it will do the, the whole thing. It'll exfoliate, identify, stack, and then characterize them using a bunch of different techniques. Um, and in this work, the kind of key skills you develop is coding uh, in Python and LabVIEW, uh, work with optical instrumentation, atomic force microscopy, device fabrication, and scientific writing communication. 
Um, we also have pure software projects, mainly focusing on machine learning identification of atomically thin materials automatically. Um, that work does a lot of, well, why did this disappear? Um, you know, it requires you to learn a lot of Python optics, and it also requires, again, scientific communication. That's very important for everyone in my group to learn. Uh, and the final two positions available in my group presently involve the optical characterization of quantum materials. And so we've received 350K to purchase a new um, magneto optical cryostat, which allows us to reach temperatures as low as 1.8 Kelvin uh, and magnetic fields as high as seven Tesla. So my lab is in a rebuilding phase where we're going to be tearing down all of our existing experiments and rebuilding them around this new system that we've obtained. Uh, and so uh, we're actually very, very excited for this. We do a lot of um, uh, zero field optical measurements now and having a magnet really opens up a whole new world for us. So in this project, there's going to be a very instrumentation heavy component, uh, but it does provide you a chance to interact with key groups at Penn State, MIT, U Maryland, NIST, UNH, and anybody else who decides to send us a sample. A lot of the times we get just people sending us interesting materials because they like the way we do our work uh, and they want to see what we can figure out with one of theirs. So the thing I like about our lab uh, in this sense is that you're always studying, you know, something interesting and new. Uh, I typically like my students to have two to three projects going at the same time. When one stalls, they're inevitably able to switch gears, work on another one. It also maximizes their um, paper output. Um, so my two graduate students graduate were rock stars, but they graduated with eight papers each, um, four of which were first author, and both have been employed at um, uh, in, in very nice positions at local quantum technology companies. So I'm, I'm very proud of what we've built up in the lab. There's a lot more building to do. Um, I'd like to think students in my group end up having pretty good outcomes. Uh, and for these undergraduate work positions, um, you know, if you're interested, I fully echo what Joe said. I don't like it when people work for free in my group. Uh, I don't really think that's fair. I think it's a bit of an exploitation. So um, you will be funded or compensated in some way. Um, Oscar Federal Work Study is a wonderful way for me to, to fund you because I don't pay you a dime. It's great when research budgets are tight and they are very tight on our end. Um, Another way we can compensate you is the research credit with Physics 408. And the final one is giving you a wage position, which um, I can fund through a grant or we can get some assistance from QSEC4, but there's always a way if there's a will. So if you have any interest in working in this specific area of quantum materials research, please reach out to me. If you're interested in any of the other areas, largely in quantum that I've listed, please reach out to me as well. And I'm happy to help connect you up with the right people who can help you answer the questions you have and hopefully find, you know, something, um, uh, what do you call it? Something cool to do. So that's that's pretty much all I have to say. And I think, think the baby, the baby's still asleep. So if you have, if you have any questions or heckling or complaints, that isn't Joe Renault. Uh, I'm just kidding. I love you, Joe. Uh, you know, feel free to to ask them now. I will just, your... uh, uh, with my heckling, I will just say that I I know some of the students that have gone through Patrick's lab, and they have uh, they they have been very very successful. So I would highly recommend it. That's the only heckling I would do. Oh, honey. Um, I would also like to make sure to clarify, just in case, because I had to find this out the hard way my senior year, that you cannot simultaneously get physics 408 credit and be paid in the same semester. Oh, really? You cannot. Whoops. No. So um, <laughs> well, just for any students, if you're looking for physics 408 credit, which is, of course, a requirement, just be aware that you cannot be paid for that research simultaneously. Because or according to a rule at Mason, you can't get credit for something. <laughs> or you can't get caught. But there this is go. recorded and going on Spectrum's website. So don't do oh, that, okay. kids. All right. Wink a wink. There we go. <laughs> no, yeah, don't mess around like that. It's not worth it. Anyone else have any questions? I had a quick one, actually, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, Michael. Are, so you mentioned some of the things that quantum computers are better at than 
normal ones, are they are quantum computers just better at everything compared to classical no. computers, or is there some things no, that classical there, computers? There, there are definitely things classical computers are better at. Like, for instance, Adobe opening a Word document never going to be faster on a quantum computer, right? There, there are a lot of um, anybody who tells you quantum com we're all going to have quantum computers in our pocket are, are it's kind of crazy. There, a lot of people for now at least for now, are not going to have need of this kind of a device. It's intended for, you know, uh, high tech applications in um, national security areas. But also um, a lot of the first applications of this, I think, are going to be in chemistry and physics um, for solving condensed matter physics problems, where it's you usually have to approximate approximate away entanglement in your wave functions when you're doing simulations. Now you don't have to. You can um, include that as a as a, a base component of your of your simulation. Um, and in chemistry, being able to simulate the interactions between small molecules, and you can use that for both fundamental, you know, industrial physics or industrial chemistry uh, applications, but also for for uh, medical uh, uh, advances. Interesting. Okay. And there are people using it um, for. Uh, for studying uh, astronomy problems. And that's a new underdeveloped area. So if you are ever looking uh, for interesting problems to solve in that space, or you find that your computational needs just aren't being met, um, there are ways that we can help you guys get access to uh, computational time on quantum computers that exist presently. That's actually kind of a really neat thing is that these computers are exist in a very basic levels right now and you can remotely program them uh, and run your code on them right now um, for free. So IonQ and IBM both offer free access to their quantum computers and um, QSEC has good relations with both of them. So we're able to grease wheels if you need a little bit more qubits at your disposal. Yeah. That's great. Any more questions? I just, uh, thanks guys for coming and um, speaking. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate your contribution um, to our organization. And this is gonna be extraordinarily helpful for students, um, especially because of how honest it is and echoes the principles that we've been trying to, <laughs> to tell everyone as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. No problem. Yeah, thanks thank for having much. me. It's good to see you all. Hope you have a good Great day. Great seeing you, Joe.